Good morning. This is the Waking Up Bipolar podcast, where we discuss bipolar disorder, spiritual awakening, and everything in between. I'm your host, Chris Cole. Today we are joined by Dr. Carolyn Coker Ross, internationally known author, speaker, expert, and pioneer in the use of integrative medicine for the treatment of eating disorders, obesity, and addictions. Dr. Ross is a graduate of Andrew Wiles Fellowship Program in Integrative Medicine, is the former head of the Eating Disorder Program at internationally renowned Sierra Tucson, and is a highly revered consultant for treatment centers around the U.S. She is the author of three books, including one of the first books on binge eating disorder, the Binge Eating and Compulsive Overeating Workbook, and her recent book, The Emotional Eating Workbook. Her newest book, The Food Addiction Recovery Workbook, was just released on September 1st, 2017. Dr. Ross currently has a private practice in Denver and San Diego, specializing in integrative medicine for treating eating disorders, addictions, mood and anxiety disorders, and obesity. Dr. Ross comes from a health at every size, intuitive eating, integrative medicine approach that seeks to liberate not oppress i am tremendously grateful for her presence in my life and the influence her expertise has had on my own location with binge eating disorder addiction and bipolar recovery thanks so much for joining us Hey everybody, I'm really excited to tell you that I am joined today by Dr. Carolyn Coker Ross, who is a medical doctor, an integrative physician, and someone whose work is so near and dear to me for reasons that you might only know if you've read my book. But I have a really interesting location in that I have what I call the three headed monster. I have bipolar disorder, I have a history of substance use, and I also have this combination of disordered eating and body dysmorphia. And these three things combined sort of move around like planets around the sun, and I can't ever quite say where one ends and the other begins. So folks like Dr. Ross, who are really providing a lot of resources for things like binge eating and how mood and food are related and how we conceptualize the way we think about our bodies, the way we think about food is so critical to my recovery and my quality of life. So Dr. Ross, thank you so much for joining us today. And how are you? I'm great, Chris, and it's so wonderful to be on your show. I'm really happy. Well, I just know that we're going to benefit so much from your wisdom. And before we even get into anything, you are about to come out with a book. Is that right? What's the new book? Yes, my new book is called The Food Addiction Recovery Workbook. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out on September the 1st. And I'm really excited about it. uh, At the end of a a three-year writing binge, so to speak. (laughs) (laughs) Nice word. Yeah, I know. We're all using that word now, TV binging and all that. That's why I really like coming on shows like yours to talk about what people are really struggling with in terms of their eating, um, all jokes aside, you know? Of course, of course. Yeah, and it's, you know, language is so up right now, and I think everybody is becoming so conscious of, like, what type of language is liberating and what type of language is limiting, Yes. And, and I think it's an important thing to be aware of. And then it's like you have folks that are like, oh, don't be a snowflake or whatever. And, and then there's other others of us are like, hey, I'm like Iceman, you know, like this is important to me, but I'm not fragile about it. You know, I want people to feel like they're honored in their individuality and authenticity. And that's what really attracts me to your message right now. It's like there's a spiritual component in the sense that we're free to be authentically who we are. Does that sound right? Oh, I I love the way that you put that and especially the snowflake and iceman analogy because I think it is true that the language is rapidly evolving in this field 
And it, it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, I'm an African American woman and I remember during the sixties, how we went from, you know, that how we described ourselves went from, you know, all the way back to Negro as James Baldwin's movie showed to black and then African American. And in between, you know, people were not sure what to say and what was appropriate. And I think in this field, we're struggling kind of with the same thing. As a physician, you know, we have our own language, which we use to describe body is- body image issues and, you know, weight is- weight concerns and all of that. But it's it's really gotten difficult to know, you know, where is, it's appropriate to use what terms. This is really interesting because intersectionality is something that I'm so passionate about bringing up on this podcast. And I'm something that you and I had a chance to connect on before this podcast is a movement that you and I are both very passionate about, which is health at every size. And this idea that there is an activism, an activist movement being generated in individuals and in an organized way to reclaim sort of our right or our occupancy of a diverse experience of body sizes and shapes. Mm-hmm. And as I just want to say amen, Chris, because that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, and it's like, to me, I'm curious um, from your location as an African-American woman and such a highly esteemed physician like where do you see this movement as far as the relevance for personal and collective liberation given all that you've had to achieve in your life yeah i mean i think it's really interesting because it's happening also in gender and sexuality issues and all of us are having to learn a new vocabulary there too so it just seems like in the universe right now that when you talk about spirituality, this is kind of how I look at it, which is that, you know, there's a movement afoot to enable us to truly be able to own who we are and be who we are, no matter what our color, no matter what our gender, our sexual orientation, no matter what our size. And I think kind of the big picture, if we, you know, we're standing on the moon and looking at what's happening to humankind right now is uh, I think there is a spiritual movement afoot that really is about us, you know, reclaiming our authentic selves and not being so focused on the external appearance and, you know, every, everything around race, sex, gender, uh, weight diversity is all, I think, heading in that same direction. Gosh, it's so true. And like I something that I feel like is a big part of my spirituality is being more conscious of not necessarily that I know the experience of others that are have that are in different locations or different bodies or whatever it is, but that I have the humility to recognize that their reality is valid no matter what it is. Yeah, well, I think that's where the Iceman versus the Snowflake comes, because in every movement um, that seeks to free people, you know, there's often a period where, you know, there's a lot of anger and backlash and, and so on. And as a medical doctor, especially uh, dealing with some of these very um, sensitive issues uh, of addiction and eating disorders, you know, sometimes doctors have been less than sensitive to people who are struggling with those issues. There's still a lot of as you know, stigma around mental health issues. There's still a ton of stigma around substance use issues. Um, But I think over time, uh, even the medical profession is beginning to wake up to the need to, you know, accept more diversity. And I I just saw, I, I wish I had the reference for you, Chris, but I could send it to you later if you're interested for your listeners. But I just saw an incredible, um, post, by a, a very accomplished surgeon who, who I think had done a lot of bariatric surgery or, or no, it wasn't bariatric. He did over a thousand heart surgeries and he came out and said the medical profession for the last 50 years has been a hundred percent wrong about what it takes to manage your food and what to eat and what, whether exercise and that whole calories in calories out 
uh, philosophy was accurate or not. And he basically said the medical profession has completely basically screwed the pooch on that. And I have agreed with that for a long, long time and seen so many people being urged to go on these diets that just make their lives miserable, make their problems worse, reduce their self-esteem, uh, and, and cause just tremendous amount of suffering when there really has been no evidence to support any of that. And so I think, I think we're in a new era now, and I'm really excited about it. Oh my gosh, it's so true. And I have to tell a little story because the last time that I was, you know, I don't, I don't want to say traumatized in the sense that someone would be offended that, that their trauma was being diminished by this, but just in the sense that I felt re-traumatized because I went into a physician's office a couple years ago, and this was when I decided, like, I'm only going to work with physicians who have awareness around health at every size because I went in there, and not only did the doctor tell me that I needed to lose 20 pounds before the next time that I saw him, okay. but, which was like, oh, gosh, you know, but he also... He presented it in such a caring and compassionate way and started and was like, or like the tone. And he was saying, he was saying, you're a father now. Like this is, it's important for you to be around for a long time. This is a big deal for your life and your health. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, he's telling me it's all the carbs. Just cut the carbs. Oh, jeez. And... I started to sweat. I mean, like I get nervous around anything when anyone tries to um, peg me down on my on my body size or something, and yeah. and I just felt like my goodness, like that was this physician's very best attempt at yeah. motivating me towards wellness. When every single blood marker, everything was perfect except the fact that the scale wasn't right for his conception of health and can you speak to that and how how your book is is hitting this intersection of health at every size and body diversity and also this idea that like the one size fits all diet approach or food approach is just not serving us as a population it's not only not serving us it's damaging us and i think it's probably for most intents and purposes, the cause of the obesity, quote unquote, epidemic. But, you know, I think I, I just want to say that the medical profession still is being taught that, you know, weight is a marker of health. And um, that is going to take a long time to change, although it is changing. Just remember that only 50 years ago, doctors were going on TV advertising smoking advertising cigarettes, you know, that, that they would show doctors actually smoking on cigarette ads. So that was only 50 years ago. And I, it may take us nearly as long to change this, but I hope not. Um, but the newer articles that are coming out in the research really are showing that we really don't know how to help people lose weight and keep their weight off. And more importantly, we really don't know if weight is a marker for any health concerns, you know, that the studies have been so tainted. And that's why I like Tracy Mann's book, uh, Tales from the Eating Lab, I think it's called. Um, but she's been a researcher in this field for, I, I think, her whole career. And I actually interviewed her uh, for a podcast uh, about a year ago when her book came out. And she talks about all of the research and and she debunks most of it, showing that we just don't have the information that we need in order to be able to give people good advice. And what we don't do know shows us that for most people, trying to lose weight and you know keep it off just starts a vicious cycle that ends up hurting them more than the 20 pounds or 10 pounds or even 50 pounds or more that um, people are telling them to lose. So in my book, The Food Addiction Recovery Workbook, I've had uh, some people question me about the term food addiction. And I know in, in uh, a lot of the uh, eating disorder associations associated with binge eating, 
there's there's a, a lot of concern about using that term. I use the term because there are so many of my patients who still think that food is addictive. Mm -hmm. And they still believe that they are addicted to food. And what I wanted to show in the book was really to show that it's not about the food. I don't think it's really ever been about the food. Um, what, what I see is that more spiritual component that you're referring to where I'll, I'll talk about two things. One is the spiritual component. The other is a genetic component. And I want to be sure to mention both. Um, but when you've had um, childhood injuries, whether they be trauma with a big T or trauma with a little T, or whether you've been bullied or I have so many patients who've been neglected, you know, whose parents themselves had uh, mental illness or um, had substance use disorders or were not around for various reasons, all of these childhood industry in injuries actually change the function and the connections in the brain. Mm -hmm. And I, have you heard about the uh, reward deficiency syndrome, that term? I don't think I have. Do you mind explaining that to me? Yeah, well, I think everybody has heard about dopamine and how it works on the brain. And dopamine is considered to be the reward um, neurotransmitter or brain chemical. So if you're, um, you know, if you see a sunset or if you're, if you have sex, if you have a glass of wine, uh, lots of things that give us pleasure actually give us pleasure by creating an increase in dopamine. If, however, you're a child who has a genetic predisposition for the, um, this reward deficiency syndrome, then when you see a sunset, your level of enjoyment is less perhaps than someone who doesn't have this predisposition. And that's because this uh, research has shown that that's because of the a reduction in dopamine receptors in the brain in particular people, which means that they don't get the same rewards from food, from other sources of pleasure that someone who doesn't have that. So again, if you've had childhood injuries, if you um, have uh, genetics in your family, like um, certain uh, family members, your parents with substance use disorders or other mental uh, illness issues, then you may have this genetic condition called reward deficiency syndrome, which puts you at risk for impulsive and compulsive disorders. So that could be everything from ADD to depression, anxiety, overeating, um, other eating disorders, etc. So that's, that's the genetic component. And I, I do spend a couple of uh, chapters in the book uh, really talking about kind of this underlying thing that people don't know about, you can't see, it's really difficult to test for, um, but it really can create, even from a young age, uh, a tendency for eating disorders and addictions. You know, this is such an interesting point because in my location with bipolar, and I, I like to say inhabiting a bipolar body, it's mm -hmm. it I have certain susceptibilities to the the chemical extremes and what what frustrates me sometimes is folks just kind of use this sound bite like it's just a chemical imbalance and they don't yeah. realize that you literally can't have an experience without a chemical reaction in your body so it's like you know to to imagine that this supposed chemical imbalance is not connected to every other system and every other mechanism going on within one's not just one's body but within one's environment and upbringing and the society and the socioeconomic mm -hmm. class and whether or not I, I met this wonderful man the other day who was who was studying the uh, neurology of oppression and how oppression messes with our nervous system and neurological makeup and how our how our limbic system and prefrontal cortex are communicating or not and all this kind of stuff it's just so much more complex and and I don't get scared by that I don't care if somebody takes away my little chemical imbalance soundbite I actually want freedom 
to be able to come from all these different locations and know that the more holistically I'm approaching my life, the more complete and free I am to be myself. And like, this is, this is where I'm like, yes, Dr. Ross is talking about food addiction, but also you're talking about a spiritual awakening where we get to be ourselves. A hundred percent. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And the spiritual component is, you know, I see so many patients who've had these childhood injuries who, or who have these genetic predispositions that can make them feel outside, like an outsider or isolated or not like everyone else. And all of those things, as you say, create some reaction in the body. And those reactions then are met with whatever the child, the teenager or the adult uh, can use in order to make themselves feel better. And sometimes or oftentimes it's substances, whether it be drugs or alcohol, food or, um, you know, sex, gambling, etc. Mm -hmm. So people are doing the best they can to deal with, you know, disturbing emotions or emotions that are overwhelming, even happy emotions, as you know, can be overwhelming sometimes. So we need to really stop just focusing on the superficial level of behaviors and work also with helping people uh, manage their emotions, regulate themselves, come into some kind of um, not control, but more mastery of their ability to kind of navigate life's challenges without it being too overwhelming or too painful or causing too much suffering. And then get into the beliefs and understand where these beliefs came from and whether or not, like some, I I just always tell a a story of one of my favorite patients who uh, was really small as a child. He was sickly and uh, tiny. He had an older brother and he and his older brother would often get into little skirmishes and his older brother would always win because he was bigger and stronger and older And then when my patient, Scott, got to be about 16, he was actually bigger than his older brother. Uh, And his eating disorder had already started, so he was a a binge eater. And at one point, they got into a big scuffle, and Scott got so angry, he pulled uh, his brother's bedroom door straight off the hinges and kind of scared the bejesus out of him. And when he and I talked about that and kind of went back to that feeling and what the belief was underlying that feeling, he realized that he had the belief that bigger is better. Mm. You can see where that would come from, right? Certainly, certainly. Yeah. So once he recognized that, then he could ask himself, do I really need to hold on to that belief? Or now as an adult, can I navigate my world with more self-confidence without using food to stay big in order to feel safe. And I think there are so many women who who have that same experience where they've been abused or uh, traumatized. There's men who, who've had, who have other, there's so many different ways you can uh, have beliefs that then drive your behaviors. But underlying all of that is what you're talking about, Chris, which is the deeper urges of our soul. When we're not living from our authentic selves, what is happening is that we're uncomfortable. It's kind of like one of my friends said, you know, when he makes a decision that he knows isn't right for him, he feels like he's choking. And that's, you know, but we don't all have that much body and spirit awareness. So sometimes we don't notice it or we don't recognize it until down the line. But Whenever you're not living from your authentic self, there's always a consequence and there's always a need for compensatory behaviors to control your reaction to not being yourself. I don't know if that's if I'm being clear on that. Oh my gosh, you're being crystal clear to me and I just want to magnify it actually because this compensatory nature of the psyche, I think what's so fascinating is 
we sort of like separate the mind body so much and you know all about this because you're an integrative physician but that we, we separate the mind and body so much so we go like okay well a principle of the psyche is that there's compensation and if you feel small maybe you'll try to make yourself big in certain ways and blah 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 but we don't extend that to the body as if the same mechanism is not at play and and something that was so interesting to me is it like health at every size you're we're talking about an intersectionality of what it means to have like quote a normal body but then there's also this whole piece about like how do we identify gender and what a body needs to look like and you know if I don't want to ascribe to a masculine body what does that mean my body needs to look like and if I don't want to be um, some sort of standard feminine expression what do I have to do to my body then and it's so much of it's unconscious yeah, it's so much of it is unconscious. I think that's the key, Chris, because when you bring it to consciousness, then you can make your own choices. They don't have to be dictated by society. And that's what's so beautiful about uh, the, the, uh, the what you're talking about, intersectionality around gender and sexuality or sexual preference is, you know, we're learning a lot with transgender people, many of whom also have eating issues and mental health issues. We're learning so much about that, how we have kind of locked ourselves in these boxes of, okay, well, if I'm a man, I have to look like this. And if I'm a woman, I have to be traditionally beautiful in this way. And it's just, it's really kept all of us really from experiencing true authenticity and being able to be as creative with our lives as we really would like to be. So true. And this idea of, like, you know, you know uh, part of my story, but for listeners that don't know, I became a bodybuilder largely in part because, as even as a teenager, because I felt like I wasn't masculine enough. I was a very sensitive little boy, and, you know, where, where sensitivity and bipolar overlap is somewhat mysterious, and I'm okay with that, actually, but... This idea of being such a sensitive little boy and then needing to have my body type or my body size compensate for this really personal inward expression of my essential nature was mm-hmm. so incredibly painful. And I, I, know, I know that that rigidity and that compensation – led to psychosis for me I don't think it's the whole story but I know that it played a big part in it and Mm -hmm. what's so fascinating to me is that when when I did have the psychosis nobody was asking me like to try to feel into or understand well why did you need to strip off all your clothes and say that you were neither a man nor a woman like what Mm -hmm. why was why like you know, you could have psychosis and do all kinds of wild things, but why was it that? There was no value in the unconscious material that was brought up. And I say that because I want to ask you as folks that are dealing with this overlap of really everything. I mean, gender expression, sexual orientation, um, mental health location, diagnosis. Food is so such an interesting dynamic here and could you explain maybe even in a rudimentary way for folks that are kind of just getting introduced to this type of thinking how food and mood interact and play off of each other sure it's very complicated and and I think it's part of what makes uh, the whole dynamic of people trying to lose weight much more complicated. But just in general, if we go back to that reward deficiency syndrome, so now you take a child who's born into a family, and that family has certain genetics which predispose them to certain disorders, and then that child also has life experiences um, that that also affect them and affect their biology, their physiology, um, you know, their nervous system, and so on. And then you you kind of bring into the uh, 
bring them into whatever period in their life when they start using food to comfort themselves. And it makes sense that people who are not getting as much pleasure in their lives, they may have early signs of depression or anxiety, their dopamine levels are low, that when they eat a normal amount of food or even comfort foods, that sometimes they don't get the same bang for their buck that someone else who doesn't have that genetic uh, predisposition and that life experience gets just because their brains work differently. Mm. And so then it becomes habitual often for people to use food in excess because they're looking for that feeling that, um, you know, that they need in order to feel comfort, to feel safe, to feel happiness, etc. And so food is, you know, is a, it's a common problem for many people uh, just because it's being used in a way to self-medicate either negative emotions or even overwhelming positive emotions. It's being, food is often being used unconsciously. And that's what I really want people to get. And that's what I talk about a lot in my book is that when we use food unconsciously, to self-soothe, then that's when we get into problems with food. And that can also have an effect on mood, as you probably have experienced in your life. Certain foods are much more triggering for certain um, different moods. And, you know, it just creates a vicious cycle where we're kind of chasing our tail, trying to feel better, but then we feel worse. So we, you know, eat this or eat that. Uh, and then we feel maybe good for a little while, but then worse. And it just goes on and on and on. And I think this is what people call food addiction. Um, but again, I think it's much more complicated than a specific food being addicted. And, and interestingly, the studies on that have been done in all in animals, I just want people to be clear, because there's a lot of press about sugar addiction and all of this stuff. And for some people, probably sugar is not a good thing, just like for some people, you, you could drink alcohol every day and never become an alcoholic, but for others, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Sugar, food, you know, gambling, sex, all work on that brain reward system. So it's really important to know that you have to kind of figure some of these things out for yourself. But the animal studies really are showing that sugar is most addictive when people when the animals have been given sugar and then deprived of it, then given it, then deprived of it. And that's exactly what people who say they're addicted to chocolate or whatever do to themselves, correct? I mean, we... Yeah, totally. Like, I remember when I, I went to recovery for my binge eating disorder and... And it was like you you actually just just eat eat what eat this stuff and sugar is going to be a part of this uh, daily intake in certain forms and and I remember being terrified. I mean, I was terrified of even just a banana because there was sugar in the banana and and I grew up in a in um, environment where the diff there was no difference between a banana and a lollipop like that they both had sugar and therefore they're both equally bad <laughs> and yeah. it was very challenging for me and I I felt very unsafe and unsettled eating the food but what I noticed over time is that I committed to my recovery because I was so desperate but what happened was it just lost its power it's like if, you know what it reminds me of actually we're talking about sex and dopamine too it actually reminds me of being a teenager and being so sex crazed and yeah. it's like and like That's and true. and I could and like I had had to have sex and like what do I need to do to get sex and all this kind of stuff. And then and then a little later in my life, and not a lot later, it's not like my sex drive had, had dropped off a lot or anything, but just because sex had become more familiar, it wasn't such a huge deal. And it lost its power. I love the way you said that. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and and what's really interesting from the bipolar standpoint, when I feel into what that's like to have these rewards, whether it's sex or food or, or even with my substance use disorder history, and 
Um, and I've been sober for uh, over 10 years now, so I really relate to the addiction component. And But it's like, there, the you're so right that it's like, it actually creates a lot of destabilization to the system to be loading and then retreating from any type of yeah. input you know it, any kind of restriction just sets you up for your next binge so i think it's really important for people to understand that dynamic because you know th- we're such a diet obsessed culture and you know most of the patients that i see in my practice have been on diets some of them since they were 2 years old and they've been told this is bad, this is bad, you know, this is okay, don't eat this. And so they have so many do's and don'ts. And that kind of explains why many people who are, uh, you know, in a larger body tend to have nutritional deficiencies. Uh, and you think, well, wow, how could they have nutritional deficiencies? You know, they're overeating or they're, you know, their weight is, is high. But it's because of the this diet kind of culture that we've created in which people don't eat foods that they that their body needs and wants. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what I try to get people through and the food addiction recovery workbook is a workbook. So they it actually takes readers through a process, the same process that I use with my patients to help them understand these connections and to identify some of their beliefs and to, you know, become more aware of some of the ways in which their eating patterns um, are causing them suffering and, and how they can do that differently. Gosh, you know, I'm so inspired by the fact that you're putting out a workbook instead of information, ju- I should say instead of just information. I know I'm going to use the book because I always want to stay engaged in my process around around really trusting myself, you know, so much of the diet culture is, and, and really the conformist culture, like when we're talking about health at every size, like, you know, I actually wonder how much of this, the, the way we marginalize larger bodies and the way that it's not actually backed by the most recent literature, like how much of that is oppressive, you know, it's like, uh, like that's so funny you brought that up yeah and health at every size is an activist movement which is kind of a little maybe counterintuitive for folks that don't have a bigger body and know what it feels like to be treated differently even when you lose just a little bit of weight the way people react to you differently treat you differently the way you, like so much of it is not really how you at least for me when I had these periods where I was unhealthy and dieting and things like that, and I was losing weight, it wasn't so much necessarily that I felt better in my body. It was actually that I felt better the way other folks were perceiving me. Yes. So who were you doing it for? You have to ask yourself, you know? Oh, certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Gosh. So this is rich. And the fact that it's a workbook, I want to really encourage folks to check this out because this is a chance for you to actually go through the work and make changes rather than just digest more information that maybe isn't going to get integrated and assimilated into your un- your unconscious and really into your felt sense of your body. So, Yeah, and I think it's also important for your listeners to recognize that the workbook is about returning your power. It's about you becoming empowered through doing the workbook. It's not about me telling you as an expert, you know, obviously I am an expert in the field. I've had 30 years of experience in working in this arena, but I'm not telling you do this, do that. I'm giving you information and I'm a lot helping you to go through your own process so that you can have your own answers for yourself, what works best for you, not some one size fits all. I agree. Health at every size is the most important way that we can relieve the suffering that all this dieting has caused. Gosh, such a beautiful message, such a timely message. And I cannot thank you enough for joining us. You'll have to come back because 
the it's a your your holistic approach and really your your ability to to swim in and out of medical paradigm, social justice, uh, personal freedom, even enlightenment is just so beautiful and inspiring to me. And what I really the aim of this entire project that we're doing with the Waking Up Bipolar podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. It's certainly been a pleasure to talk with you. I really have enjoyed it. Check out Dr. Carolyn Coker Ross's new book, The Food Addiction Recovery Workbook, How to Manage Cravings, Reduce Stress, and Stop Hating Your Body on Amazon. Connect with Dr. Ross and her work at carolynrossmd.com. All right, everyone, that's it for now. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to contribute your own thoughts, experiences, and resources, check out our Waking Up Bipolar Facebook group. Website links are included in the podcast notes. This has been another episode of the Waking Up Bipolar podcast. For more episodes, visit wakingupbipolar.com. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. And if you feel so inclined, please rate the podcast or leave a review so other folks may have an easier time finding this. If you want to learn more about me and how I came to care about the intersection of bipolar disorder and spiritual awakening, you can check out my book, The Body of Chris, a memoir of obsession, addiction, and madness, or visit coldcoaching.com for life coaching, blog posts, social media, and of course, more episodes. Be well until next time.